of uh, Dr. Babur Raj, who has been uh, instrumental in giving me points on how to present the oxygen therapy. And uh, coming to this uh, wonderful uh, Nobel Prize that was given to, to uh, given to the three doctors, uh, Kaylin Radcliffe and uh, Professor Semenza, for uh, identifying how cells respond to varying oxygen levels in the body. So they found out that each cell has a sensing mechanism by which they can uh, respond to varying concentrations of oxygen in the blood. And how each cell responds is by a genetic mechanism, which the three of them independently discovered and uh, got the Nobel Prize in 2019. So going to the traditional concepts of what we are taught on oxygen therapy, uh, we'll just start with a case, a uh, 45 year old gentleman comes in respiratory distress, he's not able to lie down, he's tachypneic, the accessory muscles are active, there is no strider indicating that there is no dom uh, no severe upper airway obstruction. There is hypoxemia on room air and the blood pressure is 140 by 90 because of the oversympathetic response due to hypoxia. On auscultation, you hear bilateral breath sounds and a few crackles are heard. So classically in the present situation, we would take this as COVID unless otherwise proved. And uh, by routine teaching and by, uh, by our spinal reflexes, we would start the patient on oxygen so as to keep the saturation more than 92. And while we start the patient on oxygen, we would ask the history, reevaluate the patient and then give a focused medical approach. This is what we follow normally. So we, we usually start any patient on oxygen uh, who requires oxygen with the low flow device, which is known as the nasal cannula. So the nasal cannula is started at uh, one liter per minute and uh, we hike the flow of oxygen up to six liters per minute. So one liter is approximately believed to give a fraction of inspired oxygen of around 24 and the six liter is attributed to give an oxygen concentration of around 44%. So it's around 24 and reach up to 44 provided the patient's inspiratory flow demand and the minute ventilation that the patient is, is reasonably uh, at, at a, a comfortable rate. Now suppose this patient takes a, has a high minute ventilation and is a high, uh, the ventilator requirements are very high, what will happen? This patient tends to take in more of atmospheric oxygen rather than the flow that is delivered by the nasal prongs. So six liters would not satisfy the air hunger of this gentleman. So what will happen? 44% of oxygen that was supposed to be delivered to this patient would be diluted by the ambient atmospheric air concentration of 21%. So that is why it is known as a low flow device. So we start this patient on low flow nasal cannula and remember that there we have seen a lot of um, nurses and even medical doctors uh, applying the nasal prongs on patients. Remember that the nasal prongs should be applied over the uh, ears and then tied in front of the uh, neck so as to get adequate oxygen and uh, preventing the tube from being compressed. So this patient, after applying a nasal prongs of six liters is still hypoxemic. So his oxygen saturation is 88%. And so the next step, what we all would follow would be to go in for the Hudson's mask or the simple face mask. And the simple face mask is applied tightly on the uh, face and the tightness actually determines the amount of oxygen the patient receives in addition to the flow, the patient's breathing pattern, as well as the flow rate that is being supplied to the uh, person. Now, the, the Hudson mask is usually started at a flow rate of around six liters per minute. Why do we start at six liters? If you look closely on this picture, you can see that the face mask is actually a little ground glass or it's a little cloudy. Now, what is the cloudiness due to? This cloudiness is actually the patient's exhaled air being condensed on the mask. So you're actually giving cold oxygen through the, uh, nasal, so through the nasal tube attached to the Hudson's mask. And there is condensation. So condensation is a simple meaning that the patient is actually rebreathing. So what would we do? 
we would actually increase the flow at least one or two liters till the condensation moves out. So the, the corroborative is that in a patient with a simple face mask, if the flow is not properly kept, if you keep four liters or three liters, the patient will act, the patient will actually tend to rebreathe the exhaled air, which is in the mask. So when you start a face mask or a Hudson's mask, you should start it at least six liters per minute so that the exhaled air will just go out through the small holes that you're seeing on the mask. The next step, if the patient is still hypoxemic, they are left with the what we know as a non-rebreathing mask or a partial rebreathing mask with reservoir bag. Now, the problem of the non-rebreathing mask is that there are actually two vents on the side, which is actually a one-way vent. So the vents actually will not allow ambient air to come inside. It will only allow the exhaled air to go outside. So just look at the lady with the bag and the person on the right side with the fully inflated bag. So which would you think is the correct method of keeping a non-rebreathing mask with a reservoir bag? Remember that the non-rebreathing reservoir uh, mask with the reservoir bag actually requires at least 12 or 15 liters of fresh oxygen for that bag to be inflated. Now the purpose of this bag is that when the patient takes in a deep inspiration, fresh oxygen, which is collected in the reservoir bag, gets into the patient's uh, um, uh, nasopharyngeal uh, space. Now, if the bag is collapsed, what does that mean? The patient is having a high inspiratory flow rate, and the flow rate that we are giving, uh, approximately 15 liter per minute, is not being satisfying the demand of the patient. So what happens when the patient takes in a deep breath, since the ambient air cannot come inside, the bag collapses. So what happens is the bag continuously collapses. And if the patient's respiratory demand is very high, it is actually akin to suffocating the patient because the patient will not receive any oxygen from outside. So when you're keeping a non-rebreathing mask, ensure that the reservoir bag is at least partially expanded and uh, not fully collapsed. Now, after the non-rebreathing mask, the the the, the examples I've just given before are just low flow devices. So what is low flow would mean is that not the flow of the mask, the flow of the oxygen supply. It is actually that the flow provided by the devices that I mentioned is not able to meet the inspiratory flow demand of the patient. So that is why it is known as a low flow device. And the low flow devices are always dependent on the patient's inspiratory or the mint ventilation of the patient. So if you want precise oxygen concentration to be guaranteed to a patient, you require high flow devices, the classic example of which is the venturi meter. Now the venturi meter is made, the venturi flow mask is based on the principle of Bernoulli's law, in which what you do is you have different color coded or different valve based venturi masks which can, which are, which have orifices of different gradients or different severities. So you, when, when you apply the nasal tube or the oxygen tube to the bottom portion of the venturi uh, device, the, the principle of venturi, the way Bernoulli's principle acts. So when gas flows at a very high velocity through the small orifices, there is a pressure drop on the sides of the uh, high velocity areas. And so what happens when there's a pressure drop, the atmospheric air which is surrounding is actually sucked into the um, small orifices. So that what you get is actually oxygen, which is given by the prescribed flow rate and ambient air, which mixes the oxygen. So you get a mix of air and oxygen blended together. And based on the flow rate or the color coding you have kept, you can get up to 60 percentage of precise FiO2. So that is the advantage of the venturi flow meter. And the venturi meter should actually be kept attached to a long tube because that long tube acts as a reservoir or a dead space so that the patient in, in the in the even that the patient requires more oxygen, you can get the dead space having a reservoir of fresh oxygen. Now the patient is still in respiratory distress. We have tried low nasal prongs, we have tried the mask, we have gone into the non-rebreathing mask. Then we went into the venturi. Still, the patient is respiratory distress. Remember that there was a uh, there was a huge uh, hue and cry about the HFNC, which was the new uh, new trend 
for the new fashion in oxygen therapy. And uh, it was estimated that most patients who are tachypneic or in ventilatory demand have a, a flow rate requirement of at least 30 to 120 liters. So that flow starvation would be satisfied only by this comfortable device, which is known as the high flow nasal cannula. Now the high flow nasal cannula was based on the principle that you would heat air and oxygen, you would humidify it, and then you would carry it through a tube, which would prevent the dissipation of moisture and heat directly to the nostrils of the patient. So the basic in the apparatus was uh, a, a pump which would draw in air through the orifice of the, uh, or through the filtered inlet. There was a source for oxygen. Oxygen would come in through a tube. Then there was a pump which would actually blend the air and the oxygen together. And then it would be passed through a patented technology or a cartridge where they actually heated uh, water that was added, water or um, pure distilled water that was added to the chamber. And the vapors would actually mix with the blended air and oxygen mixture. So the patient would receive blended air and oxygen along with humidity from the vapors. And this would be carried by a heated wire to the nostrils. The principle was very good. It was very efficient. And uh, the patient would have a simple nasal prongs that would snugly fit into the nasal uh, airways. And the patient would get pure oxygen. So the gas would be delivered at a particular flow rate, at least uh, from starting from 15 to up to 60 liters per minute. And we could titrate the oxygen to get at least uh, from starting from uh, 30 and you could go up to 100% also. Now the principle was that this, ex uh, this air oxygen mixture or pure oxygen would continuously remove the carbon dioxide in the nasopharynx and which is actually the dead space and make it pure oxygen. And because this uh, flow was there during inspiration and expiration, the patient while exhalation would also have the blast of air into the nostrils. So it had a minimal peep effect. Now the peep effect was uh, around 0.7 centimeters for every 10 liters of flow. So on average, you would get around five or six or maximum of 5.5 uh, uh, centimeters of peep when the mouth was closed. And when the mouth was open, it would actually cycle out. So the, the humidification also ensured that the patient's secretions would be easy to be brought out. So basically you would set the temperature. You would start with a flow rate of around 30, which is the flow of the oxygen combined with the air from the machine. And then once the patient's inspiratory flow hunger or the inspiratory air hunger is maintained or uh, is satisfied, we would, and if the patient was still hypoxemic, we would slowly increase the FiO2 so that the oxygen is maintained along with the inspiratory air hunger. And that was the principle of the HFNC cannula. And so what was the beauty of the HFNC? We would get remarkable results immediately. So on an average, the, 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 the respiratory rate would come down by within five minutes of keeping an HFNC if the patient was responding to an HFNC machine. Uh, the oxygenation would improve by 15 to 30 minutes. Dyspnea would come down. The accessory muscles would become less active. So it was a, basically a good device or a good oxygen therapy device. And objectively, we would monitor whether the patient was responding by using the ROX index, which was actually the SpO to FiO2 ratio divided by the respiratory rate. And we could predict whether the patient would require the next next uh, level of therapy, that is the non-invasive ventilation or uh, intubation. And so you could objectively say whether the patient was responding or not responding. And there was actually predicted uh, scores for example, if the ROC score was less than 2.85, two hours, that would indicate that the patient was going in for uh, ventilation. Now the problem with the ROC score is that you're only taking into account the respiratory rate. For example, if you are not, if you are uh, in the pre-COVID era or in the, the, the time when COVID started, we, we were actually literally afraid to go into the ICU also sometimes. Some people never used to go into the ICU and so they would remain outside. So if the sister is recording or a patient who is a person who is not very adept at uh, measuring or seeing the patient's respiratory rate and grasping that the patient was having an high work of breathing, 
the only thing they would do was to measure the respiratory rate because work of breathing is not taken into account in rock score so the checkpoint is that if the patient is having in spite of an hfnc the objective rock score is showing a deterioration or the respiratory rate is increasing the patient saturation is not being maintained there is a sympathetic response then it would indicate that this patient is failing in hfnc and you would have to go into the next device which was commonly the non invasive ventilation which was widely used and if it was preferentially hypoxemia what we used to keep was the cpap device so we would keep a single pressure of um, uh, cpap which was delivered through a non invasive mask and, uh, and, and, and the, due to covid there have been certain modifications in the mask but uh, since now we have covid icus where the aerosol is shared i think uh, there is no logic in keeping these masks so you can keep a non vented or a vented mask uh, depending upon the type of device you are using and the pressure is increased up to at least uh, from starting from 5 you can go up to even 20 cm depending upon the patient's tolerance a cpap pressure will actually splint up the proximal airways up to the distal airways keep the alveoli open and also act as a ventricular boost by improving the left ventricular cardiac output now the problem with the non invasive ventilation especially in the covid era was that you had to give continuous positive attention to the patient because the marks were always on the patient's face and the there was no time when the patient could remove the mask and so what happened was that uh, most of the patients were left with the defiguring scars because of the excess pressure that was applied to the face mask so ideally by virtue of guidelines what we follow is that even if the patient Uh, unless the patient cannot even um, remove the non invasive mask ventilation for feeding we would allow gaps for at least 10 minutes every 2 hours so that there is a, there is prevention of uh, ischemia to the uh, mucosa of the face so till now we have uh, dealt with the story that uh, the patient would be started on a low flow device like the nasal prongs we would go into the hudson's mask then we would go into the nrbm and the still if the patient was hypoxemic we would try a combination of uh, nasal prongs along with the hfnc so i mean the uh, nrbm mask we would go into the hfnc machine and finally would end up in the cpap device now because of covid we would also keep mask surgical mask over the devices so as to prevent lateral dispersion of the aerosols now may in 2021 and everything changed the second uh, wave of covid and probably the third wave of covid is coming uh, we the traditional concepts that we were taught that you have to start with that you have to go with this you have to titrate up everything actually came down because we would start with face masks any patient with hypoxemia we would start with face mask the patient wouldn't tolerate a face mask we would go into an nrbm and then we were literally depressed we would start whatever that is that whatever was was available in hand we would go in for the venturi meter and we would have patients with so high inspiratory demand that most of the nrbm mass would start collapsing and uh, then came the importance of oxygen conservation so literally we were being taught that you should start oxygen you should keep high flows and then came the acute shortage of oxygen uh, concentrators were even uh, costlier than gold a, a, a one week requirement of concentrators were charged around 50000 in delhi and people were queuing for oxygen cylinders because most of the patients who covid were actually maintained at house using oxygen cylinders so then came the uh, when most of these got exhausted then came the exhaustive availability of uh, the portable oxygen devices they had they were available in 6 to 10 liters and because the patients were crying for oxygen these were given by a masks and patients used to give get a puff of oxygen so as to satisfy their demand and uh, understanding the situation the supreme court gave a, a suggested that all hospitals all institutions should have an oxygen need and the oxygen determination formula so that their oxygen sources do not get depleted and they would have a surplus quantity always so these are the concepts i think we need to learn 
you have to know the amount of oxygen supply in your hospital anticipating a second next wave or a future uh, condition where there would be an uh, exponential rise or a requirement of oxygen you should know the consumption of each oxygen device in your hospital you should plan how much oxygen you would do, that would be required for your hospital you should know how much a cylinder would last and uh, how much reserve you would have how you can conserve oxygen and uh, oxygen is a, is actually a drug with uh, volatility so it is a combustion it is a, it, it is prone to combustion and so you should be knowing about the fire and safety measures also when you are dealing with oxygen now i actually bored you bored down before trees and plants because in spite of us being so knowledgeable creatures we still do not know how plants create oxygen uh, the technology is still not and uh, we actually lag behind if we had known this technique uh, oxygen would have been uh, oxygen therapy and oxygen availability would never have been so uh, uh, difficult so i'm just going into the common ways of or common uh, procedures by which each hospital gets oxygen so the most common technique is known as the fractional distillation technique which is known as fraction because you are sucking in air you are actually compressing the air then you are actually reducing the temperature of the air passing it through different chambers which will absorb carbon dioxide impurities and then once you reach a expansion turbine we can see that blue arrow I'm sorry my um, pointer is not working when you reach the expansion turbine what you do is the air is actually expanded and cooled above the boiling point so that the air becomes liquefied now this liquefied gas is actually taken to a chamber and slowly the temperature is increased now what happens when the temperature is increased this liquid which contains nitrogen oxygen helium or dif different gases based on the different boiling points will get evaporated and this can be uh, sequentially taken or fractionally taken depending upon separate tubes which are applied at different areas of the main cylinder so liquid oxygen would boil at around 1 minus 185 degree celsius so when you apply minus 186 degree celsius 18 184 degree celsius the liquid actually oxygen would start boiling and it would produce vapors and the vapors can be taken out so as to get pure oxygen in a similar way nitrogen can be also uh, removed so as to get liquid nitrogen so this is the commonest method of uh, by which we get oxygen delivered to our oxygen cylinders and then you have liquid oxygen we have you must have seen these liquid uh, tanks these huge cylindrical tanks in your hospital these are liquid oxygen um, uh, tanks which are known as vacuum insulated evaporators and uh, these cylinders are actually containing uh, gas oxygen pure oxygen which is liquefied at a high pressure and these cylinders have actually pipes which are connected to the central oxygen supply of our hospitals now the pipes which connect these cylinders are actually uh, uninsulated or just normal pipes so liquid is oxygen is actually in a very cold state or in minus 184 degree celsius so whenever the central oxygen demand from the hospital or the valve is open what happens is that creates a vacuum now the vacuum is uh, vacuum causes what the 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 liquid in the liquid oxygen tank to come out to the uninsulated pipes now these uninsulated pipes are actually in the will uh, will actually be surrounded by the atmosphere temperature so what happens the atmospheric temperature is around 37 degrees celsius liquid oxygen is in minus 186 degrees celsius so immediately liquid oxygen becomes vapors and these vapors provide a continuous supply of gaseous oxygen to the central oxygen supply in the hospital so that is why it is known as vacuum it is evaporated and uh, it is insulated now the non insulated pipes which are in contact with the atmosphere will actually heat and remove the liquid oxygen now what is the advantage of liquid oxygen the advantage is that just 1 liter of liquid oxygen 
is equivalent to around eight uh, uh, eight hundred or uh, eight hundred liters of oxygen gas. So a forty thousand liter liquid oxygen tank would be approximately equivalent to around three point two crore liters of gaseous oxygen. So uh, the, if you if you are uh, hospital has a liquid oxygen tank, it means that the source is adequate to maintain at least three point two liters of oxygen gas. Now, the next method, but we were um, uh, the actually the prime minister had sanctioned many oxygen plants, and this was known as the pressure swing adsorption plants. It is basically a, a huge oxygen concentrator. We have all we are all aware of the oxygen concentrators, which uh, have uh, the zeolite crystals or the zeolite uh, filters, which actually filters air. and the air which is pressurized is passed through these zeolite filters and these zeolite filters have a preferential capacity of removing nitrogen from pressurized gas so what happens is air is passed through large tanks which have zeolite filters at the bottom and as the pressure increases nitrogen gets absorbed adsorbed onto the zeolite crystals and uh, once the zeolite crystals get saturated with nitrogen you can actually denitrogenize you can actually reduce the pressure and uh, you get a high concentration of pure oxygen and when you reduce the pressure the nitrogen from these zeolite crystals are removed by a separate tank so this process keeps on going and it actually swings so one tank is of nitrogen and one tank is of oxygen so as one oxygen tank is completely full you remove the oxygen and then that tank becomes empty and the second tank is removed of nitrogen so this process goes on sequentially without any intervention the only problem with the pressure swing adsorption technique is that it requires electricity for the zeolite crystals to be acting and for the gas to be pressurized so the pressure swing adsorption is a very useful technique which will produce continuous oxygen but electricity would be utilized so these are the most common methods by which we would get oxygen for our hospital now the next question is what would be the oxygen requirement per day so you know that you have this much oxygen and now we'll have to calculate how much would be the oxygen requirement in our hospital so in the covid era we had to learn all this for example in a ward you have one patient uh, who is on a non rebreathing mask and is utilizing around 10 liters per minute so 10 liters of oxygen in a minute would mean that for one hour it would be 10 liters into 60 minutes so for 24 hours just a single person's oxygen requirement is just 14400 liters of oxygen per person per day now suppose you have eight wards example covid eight you have we had around eight wards of covid uh, for covid we had around 80 patients each and uh, on an average suppose we are taking just 200 patients who are on non rebreathing mask it would approximately mean that 20 to 28 lakh 80000 liters of oxygen was being utilized per day so this was the oxygen requirement that was being utilized provided that the mask were on the patient's face now if you if you had to calculate the icu requirement also Uh, the high flow nasal cannula if the patient was kept on a high flow nasal cannula and you had started the patient on a flow rate of around 15 or 30 it would mean that 30 liters of air oxygen mixture would be utilized per patient so the problem with the hfnc machine was that a lot of oxygen was being wasted because the hfnc machine would give high flow of, of oxygen during inspiration as well as expiration so a large quantity of oxygen was being wasted during the expiration so that was the problem with the hfnc machine now coming to the non invasive ventilator most of the non invasive ventilators in our icu were being uh, non invasive ventilation was being given via the mechanical ventilator so we had ventilators which would give uh, air oxygen mixture through the non invasive mask for an so we actually calculated and found that the average oxygen requirement in an niv machine or an niv mask would be 50 liters this was partly because most of the patients have a leak so when there is a leak what the machine or the ventilator does is it will compensate for the leak so what it will do is 
it will actually increase the pressure so as to counteract the leak so each inspiration or each pressure increase would mean that air and oxygen was being driven to compensate for the leak so we calculated it at around 50 liters per minute was the average leak if the patient's fio2 was kept at 1 now what was the oxygen requirement for a patient who was on mechanical ventilator now this is a calculation i think most of us should know for example if you are having a patient who is on controlled ventilation at a tidal volume of 400 ml and you are keeping a respiratory rate of just 15 breaths the minute ventilation would be 400 ml into 15 that would be around 6 liters per minute so that means that this patient would require 6 liters of air and oxygen to maintain his ventilation now suppose we are keeping 15 breaths in this patient 15 breaths would be uh, shared among 60 seconds so each patient the, the patient has around 15 breaths over a span of 60 seconds so one respiratory cycle would mean that 4 seconds that is 15 divided by 60 or 60 divided by 15 would be 4 seconds so one inspiratory and expiratory cycle would be 4 seconds now normally we keep an ie ratio of 1 is to 2 so that would mean that the among the 4 seconds of the respiratory cycle one inspiration would be in a ratio of 1 and the expiratory ratio would be around 2 so you will have to now find out the inspiratory time so the inspiratory time would be uh, i the inspiratory time by the inspiratory ratio so for in this patient the inspiratory time is around 1 divided by the inspiratory total ratio of 1 by 1 plus 2 so 1 by 3 would be the inspiratory time now if you take it into the inspiratory time for the total 60 seconds it would be that the total inspiratory time for this patient would be approximately 20 seconds because the ie ratio is 1 is to 2 so one third of the total total respiratory cycle is going to be an inspiration so for total 60 seconds the inspiratory time is around 20 seconds so that would mean the mechanical ventilator would give air oxygen mixture preferentially during inspiration and the expiration as you know in a ventilator is is a passive process so it just opens up the valve and the entire mixture is dissipated out into the atmosphere so 6 liters of air oxygen would move in 20 seconds so for a total 20 uh, for for 60 seconds the requirement would be 60 60 by 20 into 6 liters so 18 liters of air oxygen mixture would be required for a single patient on controlled mechanical ventilation in a patient whose respiratory rate is just 15 breaths now suppose the patient's respiratory rate was 30 just the, just think about what the oxygen requirement would be and this is when the patient's fio2 is at 1 that means 100% of fio2 now when you have the oxygen source and uh, the oxygen supply suddenly the demand outreach the demand is outgrows the supply we will have to have alternate arrangements so what are the alternate arrangements we have the problem with the uh, alternate arrangements is that alternate arrangements are mainly these manifold cylinders you must have seen these cylinders where we have these jumbo cylinders which are applied to using a small pipe to the central oxygen source and all the oxygen supplies are oxygen uh, cylinders are open so as to keep a continuous source of oxygen now the problem with these oxygen cylinders is that the 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 pressure in the oxygen circuit should be at least 4 bars for most of the non invasive or you know, most of the ventilators to function so so the problem with these manifold cylinders is that they will never be able to maintain a pressure of 4 bars so once the pressure drops below 4 bars most of our ventilators stop function so we'll have ventilators showing a red alarm that the air pressure is low or the oxygen pressure is low Now that is the problem with the alternate supply of oxygen sources like the cylinder manifolds and the cylinder manifolds can also be applied in covid wards where each patient can be given cylinders at each uh, bed or what we can do is one of our engineers modified this we apply the jumbo cylinder using a pressure regulator directly to the oxygen source and then you can uh, keep delivering oxygen to each of the patients provided that ventilators are not used and as the 
pressure in the oxygen cylinder reduces you replenish it with a new cylinder now the next question is you know that you have an oxygen cylinder now you want to know how much an oxygen cylinder would be lasting so this is important both to estimate the oxygen sources depending on the number of cylinders you have and also to determine uh, the quantity of oxygen uh, required in a cylinder when suppose the patient is being taken for interventions like a ct scan or is being taken up for ecmo or for an MO, uh, for a procedure so we would have to know how much a full cylinder would last if the patient is being transported to an alternate place so conventionally there are different names for different cylinders so we have been taught e d g h and k but uh, if you look at the indian scenario there are basically just two cylinders the b type cylinders and the d type cylinders so the b type cylinders are around 3 feet high and the d type cylinders are around 5 feet high now the b type cylinders are actually filled at 120 kg per square centimeters or 150 when it is fully filled it is around 150 kg now the 150 kg per centimeter square is actually the pressure required to fill an oxygen cylinder to its brim so if if the if a cylinder is full or full you would say that the pressure of the cylinder is around 150 kg per centimeter square so you just have to remember two cylinders the b cylinder and the d type cylinder now you have to remember just one more thing the volume of the cylinder when it is full now if the cylinder is uh, full what we do is we calculate the pressure of the cylinder and then you multiply it by a cylinder capacity or a cylinder factor what is known as the uh, what is actually the cylinder factor is that suppose you have a cylinder and fill it with a liquid suppose you are filling it with water the capacity of the cylinder when it is fully filled with water would be approximately 10 liters for a b type cylinder and 47 to 50 liters for a d type cylinder so we just have to remember the pressure now i am standing near a b type cylinder which is uh, having a pressure gauge you must have seen a cylinder with a pressure gauge on the gauge on the top of the cylinder now the, if you look at the pressure gauge you will see an arrow which shows the pressure of the cylinder for example in the cylinder in the figure i've shown is the pressure in the cylinder is around 110 so that would mean that the cylinder pressure is 110 kg per cm square so a full cylinder would be 150 now my cylinder is having 110 kg per cm square now the water volume what i taught you is 10 liters so the total amount of oxygen in this cylinder would be 110 kg into 10 liters so it will be around 1100 liters of pure oxygen within the cylinder now most of the cylinders in our country especially when the climate is hot is not fully filled it is not fully filled to around 150 a factor a volume factor of around 0.67 0.7 has to be multiplied because the cylinders are just filled to 70 Seventy percent of the uh, cylinder capacity because there is a risk of expansion of the oxygen when the temperature is high. So for this person, for this cylinder, uh, I want to know the I have I know that the capacity of the cylinder is one ten into ten liters, so it is around thousand hundred liters. Now I keep this cylinder to a patient and apply a flow rate of around ten liters per minute. Now I want to know how much this cylinder would last. So the easy thing is. 1000 liter 1100 liters is the capacity of the cylinder i divide it by the flow rate of the patient the flow rate is around 10 liters per minute so 10 liters into 60 and then on the, on the numerator you would keep around 1100 so that would approximately be around 110 minutes that that would mean that this patient cylinder this patient if requiring 10 liters per minute would have this cylinder lasting for just 2 hours so if you are if you are sending this patient for a ct scan you should remember that <clears throat> by 2 hours the cylinder is going to empty and if the patient has to stay there or is delayed the procedure is delayed by 2 hours you will have to replenish the patient's bed with a new cylinder now the next thing is uh, a per, you fill the cylinder with uh, suppose 150 kg per cm cube of oxygen 
So you know that the capacity of the B cylinder is around 1,500 liters. Now the patient is taken to the CT scan machine and uh, some procedure is being done there. Now you phone the CT scan gantry, CT scan personnel and ask them uh, how much is the remaining oxygen within the cylinder. And so he is unaware to the ca calculation method. So the easiest thing you can do is you just ask the patient, the, the, C, the personnel in the CT scan to just look at the pressure gauge and say what is the reading on the pressure gauge. So if the initial pressure is known, for example, the initial pressure is around 150 kilogram, you ask the personnel to look at the pressure in the pressure gauge in the cylinder. And uh, the person says that the pressure is now showing as 50. So what would that mean? A fully filled cylinder or a fully filled cylinder with 150 kilogram per centimeter cube of pressure and a cylinder capacity of 10 liter would have 1,500 liter if it was fully filled. Now the pressure that is showing is 50. So that means the, the present capacity of the cylinder is 50, 50 into 1,500 divided by 150 or 50 by 150, which is the cylinder capacity into 1,500 liters. So that would mean that the present capacity of the cylinder when the pressure is 50 is approximately 500 liters. So the next thing you have to remember is what is the flow rate that the patient is receiving? And the you ask the uh, CT guy, what is the flow rate? And he says it's uh, the bubble is the ball is uh, is hovering around 10 liters. So that would mean that the cylinder would last for just 50 minutes. So 500 is the capacity of the cylinder at that point of time. You divide it by the flow rate that is being given. So the cylinder would last for 54 minutes. I hope the concept has been clear and has not confused you. So as I just said before, the cylinders are not completely filled to reduce the risk of uh, over expansion and uh, explosions. Now then came the concept of oxygen conservation. Everyone was running around conservation of oxygen because everybody understood that oxygen was a rare and a precious commodity. So then came that we had to utilize venturi mass. We never used to keep the NRBMs fully full. We wanted to conserve the oxygen. So we allowed the oxygen NRBM mass to collapse partially. And then you had uh, oxygen conserving devices like the pendants, where the oxygen would go in during inhalation. And during exhalation, the oxygen would be trapped in a, a conserving device, which is known as a pendant. And uh, these, these oxygen pendulum de pendant devices are being manufactured in uh, some uh, companies in Gujarat and hopefully it will be reaching in the market in a few months. Now, the next question is, you have the oxygen stores, you know how much an oxygen cylinder is going to last, you have applied the oxygen conservative strategies. Now you will have to conserve oxygen by targeting a lower oxygen saturation. So based on this uh, recent study where they uh, they uh, utilized a lower oxygen strategy or a, uh, versus a liberal oxygen strategy. And they titrated oxygen to keep a PO2 of 60 mm in the lower oxygenation strategy and a PO2 of 90 in the higher oxygen strategy or the, conser uh, the liberal strategy. All these patients were requiring at least a FiO2 of around 50%. That is their oxygen requirement is at least 50% when they were admitted to the ICUs. And uh, the, 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 the hypothesis or the, uh, the hypothesis that they predicted was that those patients who had a low oxygen uh, target would have a mortality reduction by at least 5%. And uh, the 5% the was actually a little higher, I think, because they found out that lower oxygenation target or a target of PO2, target strategy of maintaining the FiO2 to keep a PO2 of 60 mm did not result in lower mortality at 90 days or a requirement of a, a ventilatory device at 90 days among the two groups. But uh, the important point you have to understand from this uh, study is that uh, though there was no reduction in mortality, they also did not find a, an increase in mortality. So you do not have to keep a higher oxygenation strategy and you can utilize a low oxygenation of PO2 of 60 would correspond to a saturation of around 89 to 90%. So a 90% saturation 
would be more than enough to maintain most of these patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure in an ICU. So on a, on a broad thought, I would add that a target SpO2 range of 90 to 94 or 90 to 92 would be more than enough for maintaining most of these patients who are admitted to an ICU. And patients with COPD or hypercapnic respiratory failure, it would be prudent to keep 88 to 92 percent because of the risk of hypercapnia. Uh, and the next thing is you have, you have to find out where oxygen is being leaked because there are multiple sites where oxygen can go waste. So what we did was we utilized the 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 help of uh, trained nurses and trained um, uh, postgraduates and house surgeons to identify uh, each house surgeon was uh, given a responsibility. He was given as the oxygen audit person. He was given a terminology or he was uh, given a name of oxygen audit personnel. So he was also keen in doing the job. He would find out wherever oxygen was being wasted. So we found out multiple sites where oxygen was being wasted. For example, in the manifold cylinder where the small slender pipe was attached to the oxygen cylinder, there was always a leak at that point. We corrected that point. The next point was always, this is very common. You have seen this oxygen cylinders and bubbling coming from the oxygen cylinder, the oxygen regulators from the pipes. So, so these were sites where potential leaks could be identified and corrected. And uh, the first figure where that blue uh, regular oxygen, the humidifier is seen is very common. You have, you have seen a uh, lot of uh, oxygen being wasted. You will hear um, hissing sounds, water coming out through the side ports of this. So that is basically due to the missing of a valve that is seen on the oxygen humidifier. So when you correct each of these steps, you can actually reduce the amount of oxygen that is being wasted per person and per ward. And an easy method of um, you identifying leakage is by adapting or extrapolating the uh, technique that is used by tire puncture repair personnel. They utilize soap water. So you just apply a film of soap over these places and you can find out bubbling, where bubbling occurs and you can seal those areas. And the, the next important step at the patient side is that uh, Ensure that the patients keep the mask on the face, not on their head, not wasted. So we have seen we have seen many patients who just keep the oxygen mask on the bed and they go to the bathroom and come back. So try to reduce oxygen wastage at each level so that oxygen is conserved. Another technique that is um, said is to space out requirement. For example, in an ICU, there is a high oxygen requirement and suddenly food is brought and every patient is... Um, shifted from a ventilator device to a high flow NRBM device or an HFNC cannula, there may be a sudden surge of oxygen requirement. So what we can do is space the patients. For example, the, the patients who are requiring highest oxygen are fed first. Once they are fed or once procedures are done on these patients, the other patients. So plan and space the oxygen requirement so that there is, an, there is no increased oxygen surge requirement at a particular point of time. And HFNC, unfortunately, has become a big no-no in spite of its lot of benefits because it is a huge wastage of oxygen. And the other steps by which we can conserve oxygen is by, uh, at, by shifting the patient or most of the patients who can lie prone as early as possible to an awake prone position. Remember that the proning should be done by keeping the cushions on the chest and not on the abdomen so that the abdomen is free and the diaphragms can move easily. And the pressure source should be specifically unsafe so that the patient's eyes are kept strapped or uh, patient is allowed to rotate so that there is undue, there is prevention of undue pressure source on the face as well as on the ankles. And the keep um, um, also ensure and uh, teach your sisters and your nurses to ensure that the face mask is not applied too tightly onto the face and it gets compressed by uh, so that uh, you can actually keep uh, two pillows on one on the chest and one on the forehead so that the mask is free and uh, prevents it from being compressed. And uh, the Apronox study has shown that awake prone in patients, especially in COVID, 
um, uh, had benefit by reducing the risk of intubation and mortality. Another method of conserving oxygen would be to apply a surgical mask over the HFNC cannula. And uh, they, this study actually did this uh, objective measurement of keeping a surgical mask on top of a high flow nasal cannula. And they found out that for the same FAO2 value in patients who had a surgical mask over the HFNC cannula, the PF ratio actually improved by at least 30, 30 uh, a quantity of around 30. And uh, once the mask was removed, the SPO2 and the PF ratio came back to the pre-treatment values indicating that there was some amount of rebreathing and the conservation of oxygen. Now, the, the, the stretch to the extent that the patient is still hypoxemic, what we are left with is, uh, in spite of low tidal volume ventilation strategies, what we have is uh, ECMO, the extracorporeal membrane oxygen. In, in hospitals where ECMO is available and uh, the, the patient's condition is in such a way that the patient's um, hypoxemia is reversible, you can give ECMO, venovenous ECMO. Where the guidelines say that uh, patients can be put on ECMO if the PF ratio is less than 70 and the patient uh, is still hypercapnic with a pH of less than 7.2 in spite of all the uh, strategies of low tidal volume ventilation, high PEEP and an inverse ratio ventilation. And the plateau pressure is still more than 30, hypercapnia is present, the pH is still less than 7.2. You can give a trial of veno venous ECMO. But remember that the, the patient should be counseled properly because of the cost and the and it's it's just a supportive measure so that the you're giving time for the lungs to recover. And it's not a magic bullet that will uh, improve the patient in one day. So remember that oxygen is a drug. It is not, it is a precious commodity. It is a drug and it has to be utilized very carefully uh, because it is also prone to combustion. Uh, so teach every person, teach every patient who is given oxygen that they should not smoke. They should, not, they should be at least uh, away from fire sources. The sparks can actually increase the risk of combustion and producing a fire. This is actually one of our patients in Kotayam. Uh, this patient was uh, being done in a tracheostomy, a post-thyroidectomy, and uh, cautery was applied just when the patient was being given a FAO of around 60%, and immediately fire came out of the trachea, and uh, this is the problem of uh, intratracheal fires. You develop sinicae, the mucosa gets uh, denuded, and uh, so always be apparent uh, aware of the fact that when you are applying any intratracheal devices and a cautery or a machine is applied the FiO2 should always be less than 0.4. The other problem with oxygen is that hyperoxia is always a problem so if you try to keep a saturation of more than 96 it itself can produce denuding of epithelium produce ARDS mimic changes like COVID pneumonitis and produce oxygen toxicity and ARDS and especially be aware that Patients of severe COPD, when given oxygen, should always be closely monitored to see that the saturation is not falling, their respiratory rate and their minute ventilation is not coming down, and the patient is not getting drowsier. That would all indicate that the patient is going in for a hypercapnic crisis because of hypoxemia. Now, we have all been traditionally taught that high oxygen in a COPD patient would actually reduce the hypoxic drive by actually abolishing the hypoxic drive in the peripheral chemoreceptors. But uh, this, has, as, uh, this has been recently and uh, shown in a lot of studies that the, the hypoxic drive is only around 5% of the explained cause for a hypercapnic response. And this is one graph which shows a patient who is given high flow oxygen in a COPD patient with borderline CO2 levels. Now, this red line is actually the minute ventilation that happens. So immediately, and the blue line is the oxygen that has been given. So immediately after you give oxygen, high flow of oxygen, you can find that there is an abrupt reduction in minute ventilation. This is the principle also that has been applied for HFNC. When you give high flow oxygen, it actually reduces the ventilatory minute ventilation. So the patient's respiratory rate comes down and the patient's tidal volume also comes down. But just go on seeing the graph and you can see that the, the minute ventilation that has dipped is only for a short period of time. 
after the minute in spite of the minute ventilation coming back to normal the carbon dioxide level keeps on rising so that would mean that uh, the blue curve which indicates carbon dioxide is continuously rising which indicates that the explanation is not due to reduced minute ventilation so that the most most uh, objective or the most valid explanation for hypercapnia is ventilation perfusion mismatch Uh, you know that uh, the COPD lungs are uh, differentially ventilated, or there is a lot of dead space ventilation where you have alveoli which are perfused, but some alveoli are damaged due to emphysema, some alveoli are distorted due to the obstruction of airways. So what happens is, the when you are giving high flow of oxygen, the oxygen actually goes to well ventilated as well as less ventilated areas. when 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 oxygen goes to less ventilated areas god has given us a mechanism of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction so whenever there is a, a lung with a bad ventilation or preferentially reduced relative low ventilation the vessels in that area actually constrict so as to reduce the uh, amount of blood supply going to that damaged uh, alveoli so that is known as the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction mechanism Now, when you give high flow oxygen to a patient with COPD, this hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction mechanism is actually abolished. So, where you have a relatively poor ventilation, the vessels in that area just dilate. And so, what do they do? They actually steal blood from blood from the uh, alveoli that are preferentially well ventilated. So, areas which have good ventilated now become dead space ventilation. and areas which are poorly ventilated act as a source of shunt so you keep on improve increasing oxygen the areas which are less ventilated actually have carbon dioxide which is remaining there and is not washed out because of no, because of poor ventilation so the blood with carbon dioxide that comes to these poor ventilated areas cannot diffuse into the alveoli because there is now no pressure gradient or no pressure difference so in a patient with copd exacerbation who has a high minute ventilation these ventil unventilated areas will keep on having carbon dioxide stagnating and that will also result in a hypercapnic uh, uh, hypercapnic uh, um, exacerbation the last explanation is the haldane effect in which uh, hemoglobin oxyhemoglobin has a preferential uh, when you give high oxygen all the oxygen the all the hemoglobin in your body becomes oxyhemoglobin now the oxyhemoglobin goes into the the, the peripheral tissues and uh, in the peripheral tissues where there is carbon dioxide carbon dioxide actually cannot diffuse into the, um, the rbc and bind to hemoglobin now hemoglobin actually is an important proton acceptor so only when carbon dioxide has a gradient and can bind with water using the carbonic anhydrase equation can diffuse or or be uh, de- converted into h plus ions and bicarbonate ions so only when this step or when this cycle is continuously occurring would carbon dioxide in the tissues be removed into the blood now what is the problem for h2co3 which is a weak acid to uh, to split into h plus ion and bicarbonate the h plus ions have to be continuously removed now who removes the h plus ion protons it is actually hemoglobin now when oxyhemoglobin comes the oxygen should actually go into the tissues and get detached from hemoglobin now this hemoglobin which is devoid of oxygen is known as deoxyhemoglobin this deoxyhemoglobin should actually attach to the protons so once it attaches the attaches to the protons you can see that the cycle on the left side is actually shifting to the right so more carbon dioxide is able to come be be converted to h2co3 and more h plus ions can occur now when you give high flow of high concentration of oxygen the oxygen as a preferential at a preferential um, binding with hemoglobin and it does not detach so h plus ions cannot bind to hemoglobin carbon dioxide cannot diffuse into the circulation so carbon dioxide actually binds with hemoglobin alone see carboxy hemoglobin and because there is only a small amount of hemoglobin left 
uh, without oxygen, the amount of carboxy hemoglobin is also going to be less. So what happens? You have a lot amount of hemoglobin. The carbon dioxide in your tissues and your blood cannot reach into your lungs. So sequentially, what will happen is the carbon dioxide in the blood keeps on increasing. And because the patient's minute ventilation in a patient with COPD is also high, high minute ventilation requirement and the carbon dioxide in the blood cannot also go out because of patient's fatigue and uh, dead space ventilation, the carbon dioxide concentration in the blood increases. These are the explanations of hypercapnia. So around 30% of hypercapnia in a COPD patient on high flow oxygen can be explained by the Haldane effect. So just touching on long-term oxygen supplementation also based on the two trials, long-term oxygen. Now the term long-term oxygen would mean that a patient who requires oxygen lifelong. That is the principle of long-term oxygen therapy. So it is not just three months of oxygen. That would <clears throat> mean short-term oxygen therapy. So long-term oxygen therapy should be given for at least 15 hours per day for both COPD or ILD patients who are hypoxemic and has a PO2 of less than 55 or a PO2 of 55 to 59 with erythrocytosis, core pulmonary or RV failure. Now, the latest ATS guidelines 2020 uh, who prescribe, who have uh, advised on home oxygen therapy have also said that you can give oxygen in persons who have resting hypo, who have resting hypoxemia along with exercise desaturation as a portable source. You can also give oxygen in patients who desaturate during sleep or desaturate during exercise. So as per the ATS guidelines, you can give supplemental oxygen for these two groups also. Now, remember that all patients who have been um, prescribed oxygen therapy immediately after an exacerbation should be reevaluated at least within four weeks so as to reiterate the need of persistent oxygen therapy as a cause for his hypoxemia. Because many patients will tend to have multiple problems. They would have had a pneumothorax, a pulmonary embolism, infection, pneumonia as a cause for hypoxic oxygen requirement. And most of these conditions get to revert back after four weeks. And you should reiterate that the patient requires persistent oxygen therapy after four weeks. And after four weeks, if the patient still requires oxygen, you have to reevaluate at least after 12 to 16 weeks, uh, by which most of the COPD patients would, uh, around at least 50 to 60% of COPD patients would come over the oxygen requirement. So at four weeks of discharge and at least at four months, you have to reevaluate the patient uh, and see whether the patient requires persistent oxygen requirement. And all patients on long-term oxygen therapy have to be re-evaluated every six months at least to see that they, they fulfill the need for oxygen. So concluding, oxygen usage has to be modified with changing times. Non-rebreathing mass and venturi mass are the most useful of the oxygen devices. And avoid high-flow nasal cannulas whenever it is possible. You have to know the oxygen calculations, including the amount of surplus oxygen the oxygen cylinders, how much oxygen a cylinder would last, and the oxygen requirement in the event that the patient is being transported. You have to conduct oxygen conservation audits and conserve oxygen as much as possible. Teach about fire and safety to every medical personnel, including the house surgeons, the grade four workers, nursing and healthcare workers. Monitor continuous need for oxygen at least at four weeks and at six months for all patients who have been prescribed on long-term oxygen therapy. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kiran, for an excellent and mind-blowing presentation on the uh, oxygen therapy, especially we all have gone through, I'm sure, gone through the calculation of uh, liquid oxygen to gaseous oxygen in terms of liter and what is the consumption. In fact, uh, we got a uh, memo from the DC to calculate what is the oxygen uh, requirement per day based on the that time's uh, number of ICU patients and uh, and uh, 
what is the conversion of liquid oxygen to gaseous oxygen in terms of liters uh, and that those things were actually uh, not described in the textbooks also and it is very difficult to understand also so the most difficult part and less touched part has been explained in a very lucid and then uh, we all understood it uh, thank you very much thank you thank you sir any questions dr jay prakash b is telling that excellent presentation dr kiran <laughs> thank you in the chat box sir thank you sir any questions Dr. Rajesh has a question. Uh, yeah, I don't know whether it is uh, uh, our indigenous practice in at least our ICUs when the person requires nebulization, sisters just just attach yeah, the yeah. nebulization mask to the uh, wall-mounted uh, oxygen blender and increase the flow rate. Uh, while it may significantly increase oxygen consumption, does it really serve the purpose of nebulization? Is there a same similar practice have you seen in your place also? Actually, um, uh, we are obsessed with the uh, guidelines that uh, nebulization should not be applied. So I think most of the hospitals in Kerala, the sisters are so adamant that they do not give nebulization, even using the nebul the the vibrating nebulizer. This is this has been there even before COVID. Yeah, right? previously it used to be. I I, I think uh, you have to apply at least fifteen liters because the gas has to. aerosolize but is it at least uh, like the jet nebulizer or the uh, what the compressor produces yeah is it comp standard practice or just a, is our uh, indian jugad yeah i think it's an indian jugad okay. i don't think it is uh, applied anywhere else okay yeah i think it's a waste of oxygen also because the expiration also <laughs> patient the exhalation is also having uh, loss of oxygen no because it's continuously nebulized Yeah, even Dr. Ranganath has a uh, comment. Excellent presentation. Thank you, thank you. And uh, one thing, uh, Giri, I think uh, what uh, Rajesh said was uh, maybe the logic of uh, nebulization is that in pediatric children, pediatric, I mean pediatrics or children especially, it is better to give nebulization along with oxygen to prevent tachycardias and uh, to prevent that uh, VQ mismatch. So maybe that concept was. Applied for it is basically used in pediatric wards. Oxygen is given along with. But most of the places it is because of lack of nebulizers also. Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe that is also right. Because the sisters find it a easy way to uh, develop aerosol with a high flow oxygen rather than. Uh... Maybe maybe that's it. Yeah, thank you. If no more questions, we will end the uh, session. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Okay. and our request for uh, you to come often on this platform so that educate us more thank you hopefully thank okay. you thank you so much thank you giri thank you, thank you. Thank you so much